The production of anthracite coal for war has presented a major problem in the mining towns of Pennsylvania's Alleghenies. In 10 years, as a result of the increased use of fuel oil for heating purposes and the shifting of miners into the armed forces, employment in the anthracite industry fell from 90,000 to 50,000. Since the outbreak of the war, the mines have been called upon to produce 8 to 10 million additional tons of anthracite, not only to heat army camps and workers' homes and keep factories going, but to supply Canada with the coal that she normally imported from Great Britain. With increased pay, it was found that the tendency of the miners was to knock off work whenever they felt like it, and in general, to be unaware of their importance to the war effort. Joint labor management committees in company with the War Production Board brought a mechanized unit to parade through the streets of Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Hazelton, and Mount Carmel, four towns in the anthracite region of Pennsylvania. The parade was the start of a day and night program designed to explain to the miners how close was the interlocking of their work with that of the Army and Navy. In bantam cars, soldiers, Sailors and Marines arrived to meet the labor management committees who escorted them to the mines. At the shafts, they met and talked with the miners who were going down to work. To acquaint themselves with the nature of the miners' job, they put on overalls and safety helmets and went underground with the men. They were shown through the long collieries, past loaded cars, and up to the working face of the scene. A sailor tried his hand at wielding a pick, and a Marine remembered the famous French freight car sign from the last war. A miner chalked up the second line. The miners shared their lunch with their guests. At night, there was a parade and rally at the local stadium. The crowds heard Richard Mays, Secretary of Mines for Pennsylvania, pledged the state's aid in the coal drive. Alex G. Nordholm of the War Production Board talked about anthracite in relation to the war. Colliery after colliery has listed, enlisted in the greatest war production drive that anthracite has ever known. Joseph H. Kershetsky, District President of the United Mine Workers of America, assured the crowds of the cooperation of his union. The Army of the miners in district number nine. The United Mine Workers of America is behind them all. Frank W. Ernest represented the mine operators. They will cooperate with the United Mine Workers and with the government of the United States in producing all the anthracite that is needed for the duration of the war. This is management's pledge to our armed forces. Following these speakers, he rose from the battlefront made addresses. Lieutenant Anne Bernatitis, the only Navy nurse to escape from Corregidor, and herself the daughter of a miner, told of conditions during the siege. One terrible day on Bataan, we had 285 patients in our operating room in eight hours. One patient every two minutes. At the conclusion of the speeches, motorcycle and jeep drills were performed. The last horse of the 104th Mechanized Cavalry Unit helped the sale of bonds. And finally, a sham battle was staged in which a heavily protected pillbox was taken by machine guns and cannon. The next day, the success of the rally showed itself when Richard May, Secretary of Mines, consulted with the mine operators and labor committees. They were all convinced of the necessity of mining more coal for the armed forces and discussed ways to step up production. As one miner said, it looks like they put the finger on us. They were wholeheartedly behind the drive to produce 10 million additional tons of coal this year. And in answer to the plea of Lieutenant Dan Bernatitis to the miners, they replied, we'll do it. We'll keep the coal coming. <laughs> <laughs> 